Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of the Wolfram Student Podcast. I'm Sam, and I'm your host today. This is the Wolfram Student Podcast, where every fortnight we dive into a new innovative project done by high schoolers using the Wolfram language. For this episode, let's welcome Sinohe. We'll be discussing his project on topological invariance in discrete lattice via graph rewriting. Hello, Sinohe. Hello there. Nice to have this opportunity to talk about the Wolfram language. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Um, so why don't you start off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, well, I did my undergrads in mathematics, I did physics uh, back in Spain. Now I joined uh, in London, the King's College London, for doing my PhD in physics. And soon I will join the Max Planck Institute for Colloidal Interface to try to discover more about the boundaries between physics and biology. Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, I guess congratulations on being a doctorate student. Sounds really amazing. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight into your history with Wolfram? Absolutely. The first time I heard from Wolfram was in an outreach event back in Oviedo, the city in Spain where I take my undergrad. And I discovered that uh, all the things that we did in the Blackboard could be very easily translated into very nice function, manipulate function from Wolfram. And I really started to understand that uh, despite the numerical process that we can do with uh, MATLAB, Python, or other language, Wolfram could uh, help us for the theoretical people to understand the equation and try to see which were the really co uh, deep consequences of the since then I started to get involved with, with the Wolfram project and I think I joined uh, the uh, summer project of last year and then I, I joined the physics projects about understanding the rewriting rules and since then I became a, a ambassador from from Wolfram so more or less that's my relation with the Wolfram yeah no that's really cool I like what you said about um, using Wolfram to kind of model um, more theoretical things. Because um, I think like the graphs and the visualizations that are available in Wolfram are very useful to seeing things in like a different light. So I totally agree with that. Um, and then just like a fun little function uh, question that we like to ask everyone. Uh, what's your favorite Wolfram function? Well, I'm afraid for me, in the theoretical point of view, is the manipulate, because you can play around with all the equations that normally looks like very nasty uh, equivalent things with uh, this uh, equal symbol in the middle. And with manipulate, you can really play around and see what's happening with this relationship. So for me, I'm afraid uh, it's, it will be manipulate, definitely. Yeah, um, that's a new answer. We've never heard manipulate before. A lot of people generally <laughs> go with table, but... Yeah, yes. manipulates are also very powerful, I think. Maybe so. with one, with just one parameter could be equivalent. And as you can see in the table, uh, growing the different, uh, the unique parameter. But when you try to play around with different parameters, manipulate is starting to show off its power. Yes. Yeah. So getting into your project, um, you know, topological invariance in discrete lattice via graph rewriting sounds really cool and also very complicated. Can you give us a quick summary? So the idea is uh, we try to uh, understand objects that happen in other contexts, like in magnetism, in biology, or in economics. We try to build up which are the main building parts from these things. And for that, unfortunately, we need to uh, use mathematics. In this part, we're going to try to talk about a discrete lattice that basically for us will be just a grid of different points. And the idea is we play around with different configuration systems that for us will be just realization of our, of our function. We're going to see that indeed uh, this is quite a naive approach because we are taking many assumptions, but even that, in that case, we're going to get really cool uh, conclusion that could be applied, for example, to escapers. And that's the reason uh, the nickname for this project was Gracias, which means thank you in Spanish, because we are playing around with graphs, cycles that will happen when we talk about the toroidal expansion. And then finally, we get some physical insights about the skills. That's a really cool name. I like it. Gracias, if I said that right. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Um, great. So why don't you get into your project? Absolutely. So let's try to set up which are our goals. The idea is we wanted to understand why schemions are so popular thing in, in physics, in acoustics, or in biology. The idea is we started uh, by trying to discover what's the important part of it. And for that, we need to use some kind of a new theory that it was emerging in the 80s, that it was a mesoscopic theory, that basically we can explain like the sum of the thing, it's more than overall things. We can have, even we have uh, some ingredients, we can create a magnificent recipe that could have different uh, tastes that they wanted that we expect in the beginning. 
things uh, like ischemias are a very good example of this. And for us, ischemias, it will be just some kind of particle that could uh, be treated as a particle, although indeed it's not a real true object, but we can uh, push it and we can move it like a, uh, like a particle. And it happens in different systems when we have a defect when our uh, space has some particular things in which we have a singularity. And we uh, know that in physical space, infinite and, and zeros are very tricky things and maybe didn't, didn't exist in normal configuration. So we need to have a smooth transition. So when we have a singularity and we wanted to wrap around this singularity, we need to do it in a, a smooth way. And that's where schemas happen. So there is, we have a problem, we need to condense it uh, with uh, using some mathematical artifacts, and the way that nature evolved to wrap these errors, these defects, are, for example, in this case, schemas. They was firstly created in the context of uh, uh, particle physics, in the context of uh, non-sigma models, which are a bit a part of our topic, but then it was discovered that it could be applied to many, many other situations. We are going to talk about defects that happen in our system, and this is another very sophisticated word, that it's topological protected. That means that even we set that system, even we apply some perturbation, the system will stay. Uh, we can think very easily about that. For example, when we have some hole in our in our cloth, uh, although we try to move and, and compress or uh, stretch our cloth, we are always get this hole. These things that are these topological defects will can exist in many other situations, from acoustics to a magnetic system. So, as we see that it happened in many, many particular uh, situations, let's try to see which is the origin for that. And for that, we are literally trying to split our space, and therefore we are trying to obtain a discrete space in which we can go in different jumps uh, time to time. You can call it, if you are uh, uh, dating enough, a quantum version of our problem, but indeed it's uh, bigger, it's on a scale that is even smaller like that. We are going to the mathematical uh, the mathematical configuration that could host this kind of defect. So for that, we are going to develop some mathematical model. And then at the end, we are going to discover that some concepts that happen in other fields, we can understand with these very simple ideas. And for that, I wanted to mention another extra thing that indeed, uh, this thing that we are going to try to build build uh, from scratch right now is something that, in principle, uh, we don't know exactly which is the scale that it will have. So maybe we are doing a, a very small number of, of points, or maybe they are too much. That is something that uh, we saw that it was a problem in the world in the Wolfram project, and ideally, searching which is the amount of this of this object will be a very interesting part. So for that. Let's try to think of something, a grid of points that we just have in a square lattice, for example. And for that, uh, the object that we are going to uh, study, it's mathematically is, is described as fiber bundle. That for us, we can understand it like a, a high brush in which we have a two dimension that is going like up and top in the in our high brush or left or right in our high brush. And when we place a single hair on this uh, structure, we can see that we have some configuration. So basically, I, with this idea, let's try to move on a bit. And the idea of trying to do this thing is because in this mesoscopic system, we have some properties that initially they don't appear, but when we have many of them uh, combined together, we can uh, earn different extra properties. That's, for example, what, what we happen when we try to scatter a structure that it's chiral in the sense of its place in a way if it's different from its mirror image. In this kind of situation, although in principle we don't have properties about uh, this structure in the context of uh, properties that relation with light, with sound, or with other waves, when we have this kind of configuration, some of these properties are inherent, and therefore we can have new behavior for the same objects. That's something that it was exploded uh, recently, trying to see in the context of scattering of point-like uh, dipoles in, in magnetochiral uh, structures. And we discovered that even we don't have any magnetic, even we only have some magnetic behavior in our points. If we set up the points in a certain particular way, via geometry, we can obtain chirality in a free way. This is one example of the application of this theory, but we are going to go more into detail about uh, this fiber model. So let's go uh, now a bit more. So the idea is for that, we are going to use a module that is schema geometric, that it was developed uh, from the Wolfram language. And then let's try to see what can we do with it. So basically, our uh, ingredients for this thing will be some something that is called fiber geometries. That basically is like this thing that we mentioned before about high brass, that it's corresponding to fiber pandas, but in a more generic way. 
Let's try to see some examples. Imagine that our hair brush didn't have any dimension uh, uh, up and, um, and bottom, and we only have left and right. So we can have this kind of structures in which we just have left or right position. And they are discrete like, for example, this structure has only four points and nevertheless, this one has five. If we started to have uh, the, that the end part starting to touch with the initial part, we can have this kind of cyclic things that it's a mathematical idea that the end is the same as the beginning. When we started to create also uh, some dimension in the other dimension, we can have some kind of triangular, cubic or a square lattice. These things that are the square lattice in which basically we just have a direction that is going left to right and a direction that is going up to bottom that we call tribal bundles will be the basic objects we discuss in our project and indeed it was it will be the ones that will emerge this scheme lattice. There is some extra point here because this is the original case, but imagine that we apply these cycle properties in this case. We can join this right-hand side with this uh, left-hand side, and therefore we have a rubbing in one direction. We can do the same between the top part and the bottom part, which uh, will give us some cylinder, or we can do both things at the same time, and therefore we obtain what is mathematically uh, called a torus, which uh, for our understanding is just a dot. If you have play, ever played uh, a Space Invader, you can discover that it's basically this structure of this kind, one, that when you go to the corner on the right, you immediately appear on the left-hand side. And if you're starting to play around with this kind of configuration, you can start to obtain non-trivial uh, topological object like this famous Mobius strip or the clean bottle. But I'm afraid that will be for later. So now let's talk uh, about more on. about... Sorry. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Mobius strip thing, so essentially is that like a, I guess, a quiver what you said is it like a quiver representation of kind of the connections between points in a mobius strip like if it was laid flat so like in, i don't know yes let's try to see let's try to see exactly how it works the idea is imagine that we have this bundle that for the moment is not connected but we try to connect this thing with this other part right mm -hmm. we can do it joining this with this point this with this point and this with this point. And therefore, we are going to have some kind of cylinder without the, the upper and bottom part, right? Uh -huh, but we yeah. can do also, we can join this point with this other point. And this point with this other point. And this point with this other point. And therefore, we obtain the Mobius strip. That is basically what we get here. We just get this bundle in which we connect this point with this other point, which point with this other point, and this point with this other point. These are the label. Oh, numbers. OK. That's really cool. Thank you. So the idea is, when we have this structure, we can see that different properties will depend on the different geometries that we have. It will be not the same when we play around with the bundle, with the Mobius strip, or with the uh, clean bottle, that is when we also try to glue these other two structures. These are topological objects that are a projected plane and, and many other names that are sophisticated, but bear in mind that the novelty of these cuber geometries is that they are finite in the sense of from getting to this point. To this point, we need to do a a jump for that. There is no points in between all these things. Nevertheless, bear in mind that when we have a large amount of these points, we can more or less have some continuous idea. But the uh, the novelty of this is that we are going to deal with things that are discrete, that we can uh, color uh, just point by point. So with that, we can try to move uh, a little bit more. So these are our original things that are our uh, bundles. And that's, let's go to the to the field configuration that uh, we mentioned that before. If this is our high brass, this uh, field configuration will be just placing a heart from our head into this place. And you can see that, for example, in this case, will be corresponding to putting the, the hair in this position. And here, we just need to have some specific rules. We need to uh, this behave as a function in the sense of we, we cannot have uh, this thing happening two times. Maybe uh, when we uh, think about in the real space, it's not, uh, it's not uh, quite a good idea because we can have vertical hair, but uh, we need to discover that this is indeed uh, in a continuous thing. But here we're trying to do discrete approximation, so we cannot allow that thing. And we have another extra property that it's what we call a smooth or or continuity in these discrete states that basically means that we cannot jump for position for any position to the next position in an arbitrary way. We can do it with only jumping one position up, one position down, or just staying in the same position. That's a way of describing continuity in these discrete uh, fiber bundles. And ideally, uh, for us, we are just going to play with functions that are smooth in that sense, continuous in these discrete fiber uh, geometries. And it's a completely new uh, topic. What happens when we have more elastic uh, fiber bundles in which we allow jumping from here to this point? 
So this is our basic ingredients. And now we know which is our grid that basically is that these fiber bundles. We know what these are, this uh, field configuration that they are basically some function but living instead of a continuous environment, a discrete environment. And then we can move on on trying to see what's exactly going on with these things. So the idea is how can we uh, talk about graph theory when we talk about these things? And actually, it's because we can go from different states from others. The idea is we have some particular configuration of our system, and then we can evolve moving one of these points with the rules that we have previously mentioned that will be correspond to our proliferating rules that we can only do movements that are smooth in the sense of when we go from this position to this position, we see that we just move the central point, but one step to the uh, top part. Or when we are in this position, we can go back to the previous position, moving this point to the bottom part and going into this thing. So for a specific uh, fiber bundle, trying to see which are all the different allowed states that this uh, fiber bundle can have, we can create a different uh, graph and two uh, in which each edge will correspond to a different state. And we can see that two positions are connected, they are linked with an arrow that's uh, in the graph theory that we can link with a, with a with an arrow between them, if we can transform one into the other, just doing one step. So for each uh, struct that we that we have, we can transform this and we can obtain a different configuration. What's the funny part over here that we can try to uh, see which is the structure of this kind of graph? And for graph, we just need to talk about edges and vertices. And let's try to see what happens when we try to classify different kinds of fiber patterns. So for that, let's try to move on. And the idea is let's try to uh, start with some easy cases. We call it linear quivers because we just go from left to right and to bottom to top. There is no connection between the left and the right or the bottom to the top. And for that, we can do even a more simplistic case. We can talk only when we have, uh, in the first dimension, only two possibilities. And maybe the image is not clear for this initial part, but later we are going to discover why we call it linear rubber part. So the idea is when we have only uh, two possibilities, it's equivalent to having just two states. And when we have in the second dimension n cases, it's that we can go upper and upper. If we use another representation for representing which is the height of our uh, structure uh, using a color brand, we can label this uh, as the first atom, this as the second atom, and with the color we can represent will be the height of this of this uh, of this configuration. The funny part here is that for res uh, respecting that we have a smooth configuration. For example, if our color code is red, blue, green, we can never have red close to uh, green because that means that the jump in one single step will be two, uh, two steps in the, in the vertical direction. So that won't be allowed. So when we try to create which is the structure that we obtain with this kind of uh, fiber bundles, we discovered that indeed it's a rubber band because you can think about uh, a, a rubber band standing from the bottom part and we can just move uh, each of the each of these uh, edges of this particle and we can try to go uh, moving them step by step till we obtain both position and the, at the top. Maybe when we see in the cycle version, it will be understand better, but this is the, uh, the idea that we wanted to emphasize. But now we can do the other way around. Let's imagine that instead of having just two atoms, we have any number of atoms, but we can only have two steps, being in the bottom and being on the top. Therefore, we only have red or blue lines. That uh, will correspond to what we call the Tesseract binary machine that for us, we can uh, just understand as a binary number because if you, are, uh, uh, if you link the zero value with the color red and the one value with the color blue, you can see that we can represent numbers with that. It's called binary machine, but we can, uh, because we can sum uh, quantities with this, with this uh, fiber model. And when we uh, plot it, we discover that actually the shape that this graph has, it's a cube of dimension n, being n, the number of the different atoms that we have. For example, if we do it with just two uh, atoms, we are going to obtain a square. If we do it with three atoms, we are going to obtain a cube. And with four atoms, we obtain a tesseract. And in general, we can obtain more hypercubes. That's another example that we found. And now the next question that we have is what happened when we mix these two things together, when we have any dimensional number of atoms and any dimensional number of uh, of position state of different kinds. And when we obtain exactly the square version in which we have the same number of atoms of, of position and the same number of heights, we obtain what we can call it the chess key, because actually it represents the movement of a 
a queen of a king in a chessboard that it's represented by the number of 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 uh, of uh, chess bo uh, board with size equivalent to the number of the atoms. For example, that will be the movements of a chess king in a three by three uh, board. If we try to uh, characterize characterize this graph, it's quite interesting because uh, it's already mentioned which is the number of different uh, positions that you will have that is corresponding to the edges of this graph, and it's one of the online encyclopedia interest sequences. But we discovered that the number of arrows that we can have that corresponding to the edges, it wasn't yet uh, discovered. So we uh, included in the OAs, in the online encyclopedia of interest sequences, which is the number of arrows of edges that we have when we have this kind of configuration. And that was quite a nice uh, application of one of our studies because we started only with something that uh, uh, a mathematical object that only depends of uh, mathematics and maybe some topology because we talk about continuity. And then we obtain which are the different movements of a king in a, in a chessboard. Furthermore, if we, instead of talking about continuous function, we talk about elastic function, we can simulate which is the movement of a knight or of a bishop or even the queen for a chessboard. So this is a very nice connection that we found while we were uh, understanding this kind of elements. And now we can move on a bit more and we can see what happened when we're starting to left, uh, when we are starting to link left and right and upper and bottom. And bottom. So that's exactly what we uh, talked uh, before about a rubber band. And let's try to see if we can see more clearly now. So basically here we have a rubber band and then we try to move it upwards or downwards. When we have the previous case in which uh, both things were linear, we don't have the connection. Therefore, we cannot close the rubber band. But now we can see clearly how this elastic band could be moved from a bottom position to upper position just by smoothly moving uh, the, the edges of this configuration. It's funny because indeed uh, we cannot do a, a, a transition from this part to this part because that's exactly the part of the elastic uh, rubber band. So that was a nice connection and when we started to having the cyclic part in the corresponding part for the uh, for the fiber for the rubber band we got in the other dimension, in the second dimension, we can have it what we call the snake band. It's basically a band that could be understood as a snake uh, 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 trying to climb from a tree because now the cyclic is in this direction and we don't have a closing between left and right and we have the closing between bottom and top. And that will be like a tree and a snake trying to uh, climb on it. As you can see, these names are quite... Uh, quite uh, friendly because the mathematics behind them, it's not so friendly. So it's nice to have some divulgative and enriching, more engaging types. That's uh, as till this point, we have seen that all these positions are quite uh, simple because we can always connect all the position that we have in our graph, that it's equivalent that our graph, it only have one connected component. That means that we can go from each point of the graph to uh, any other point of the graph. But when we started to join left and right, and bottom to top to form the toroidal thing, we're starting to see that now there is a states that cannot be reached, that we cannot smoothly transform one state into the other for all the cases. And let's try to see that. So there was also some kind of uh, configuration of how these different uh, these bundles behave when we increase the size of our dimension, but I'm afraid it will be a bit of topic on this thing, but okay. So now we can try to see which is the toroidal case. And then it's quite interesting because now we discover that when we allow to join left and right and bottom to top, there is some components that cannot be moved. They are frozen and we cannot evolve them to obtain other things. And when we see this in, in the configuration, we see that when we have a smaller number of, of, of different positions, we only have one component. This is the graph that we have before, but in a more uh, nice display. But when we're starting to increase the dimension of these components, we're starting to see that there are isolated points that cannot be linked to the other ones. Let's try to think this more uh, deeply. We mentioned that these are a smooth uh, things. So when we perturbate this state, maybe we can go here. When we perturbate it further, maybe we can go here. But we can transform all this position if we do some perturbation, if we apply some, some change. But when we are here, even we apply any perturbation at all, we cannot move because this point, this state is not connected to, to any other point. So we can call these states topological protected because there is no neighbors that we can connect to. And therefore, these things will correspond to the effects in real system. For example, when we have a chain of atoms and at certain point, we break the binding between two atoms. 
this configuration that it will be broken cannot be evolved to the original thing. More interestingly, when we started to jump even to higher dimension, these are the configurations that, for example, are frozen because we cannot evolve to any part at all. We started to see that we have more uh, isolated points, more topological defects. But when we started to have even more situation, we started to see that, well, these frozen states are, are not yet frozen because they can evolve to other configuration, but they are still closed in their components. So we can have some uh, topologically protected defect that can evolve in different states, but we cannot jump to the other configuration. Let's try to think about physics in this case. Imagine that this thing is something that it has all the uh, all the configuration that are uh, in the minimum configuration, in the minimum energy configuration. And this thing will be states that are higher energetically and therefore not normally uh, allowed in the, in, the, in the nature. But as we cannot connect this with this one, this will be local minima of our configuration. We can think about that when we try to climb into a mountain and we go to the first peak that is not the highest peak of, uh, of our mountain, but we are still on a local minima. And we see that we can move, try to escape from that point with, uh, for example, throwing a ball. But when we see that this ball again falls into this peak. So we are starting to see that we can discover physical ideas just talking about mathematics, a very small uh, mathematical object. Let's try to see more. These are, for example, the different components that you can see that we can, in these different things, we can jump from this position to this position, but still we cannot jump from one part over here to this other part here. And that's the topological protection that we mentioned before. And now the question is, well, we can do increase this thing, and maybe we can call this thing the trivial case. Maybe we can call this thing uh, uh, case one. Maybe we can call this thing case two. And indeed, there are mathematical objects that can uh, characterize this thing, and there are the invariant topological, that they are integral quantities that could characterize this configuration. We can call it, uh, what it's called in the literature, winding number, because this is a way of wrapping uh, uh, a defect going uh, in, in the positive direction, in clockwise direction, and maybe this will be the anti-clockwise direction. So the funny part here is without applying any uh, extra condition, we obtain some nice condition of our system that we didn't expect at the beginning, but it emerged. That's the part of the mesoscopic uh, structure. Okay, so how is the connection with this physics that we started to mention before, which is the connection with the scrimmage? So indeed, it's quite uh, uh, simple to identify. Let's try to see what happened when we have this configuration uh, this uh, field configuration in our fiber bundle and this other one. And basically, if we can think on a physical system that can identify, it's in the context of matters, but it could be understood even more clearly. Let's call this state that it's pointing towards down, having our hands going down. And let's call this state going the hands up. So the question is, how can we go for hands down to hands up? We can do it in two different ways. And actually, these are the two different configurations. We can do it just rotating our hands starting from the from the bottom and rotating, for example, clockwise or anti-clockwise, and that will correspond to do this thing. And I, I, I bet you to try to do this at home because uh, you will see that it's quite straightforward because basically it's just rotating your hand from bottom to top, or you can do it other way. You can start it from the bottom position and you can start it to raise your hand towards the uh, top part. So the idea is, even these are quite naive ideas. This correspond to some well-known concepts in magnetics that are called domain walks. That basically, uh, domains in, in physics are corresponding to uh, many atoms that have the same property. And a domain wall is exactly the wall that separates two, two domains with different values. In the context of uh, magnetics, it will be things going with a spin. That is this thing that electrons and atoms have, spin up or spin down. So a domain wall is just the way that we can connect a domain that has hands uh, down and hands up. And we can try to evolve from one to the other, doing this configuration that is rotating, and in the literature it's called block domain wall, or we can do it just by raising our hands, that is what is called the nail uh, domain wall. Another question is, well, we have uh, assimilated ideas from magnetics when we uh, apply this fiber bundles. How can we obtain the schemions? That nevertheless, schemion is just rotating these elements into a cylindrical coordinate. Let me try to show this image. So we have this domain wall, and we started to rotate in this direction. And what we obtain, this structure, uh, 
Overall, it's an skewed because we have a problem that it's starting here, because here we can see that we're starting with something that is hands up. Here in the boundaries, we have something that is hands down. And how the system try to evolve to this configuration, to this configuration, it's what we call a scheme. So we saw that when we try to evolve from this thing to this thing via different ways, we can identify as different field configuration from our fiber band. Furthermore, we discovered that there is even another next uh, kind of uh, schema because we can talk about nil schemas when we uh, try to do it in this uh, in this way. We can have block schemas when we try to do it in that way. And a new way of uh, schemas that we can call quiver schemas is when we try to do the looping from way from here up to down in this direction because you can see here that all the arrows are pointing in the same time but when we try to do it in this direction in the asymptotic direction we can discover a new kind of scheme so the idea is with that from mathematics we have discovered a nice connection in the field of physics in which we can see that with this very small uh, uh, structure that are corresponding to the fiber bundles we can understand which is the scheme Furthermore, this is something that it was previously discussed in the toulouse clement relationship, but here we have developed these ideas from scratch, just using mathematical arguments. And that's basically what I discovered with this project, that the limit when we have enough technology to understand physics is actually mathematics. We can use mathematics for understanding other things like physics, biology, or economics. Okay, right. Anyway, I think that was super cool. Not sure I understood 100% of that, but I've hopefully gotten the main ideas. Um, I like the sentiment that um, like um, technology at its limit applied to physics is just pure math. Not the biggest fan of physics. I'm much more focused on like pure math, but I like the concept. I think it's very interesting. Okay. Um, your project was super cool. Again, not certain I understood all of it, but I like learning about this whole concept. And you explained it really well. Um, I guess like now that you've used Wolfram language for a while and for like really advanced projects like this, um, what are your kind of thoughts about it? Um, do you prefer it more to other coding languages? What do you think is the power of its capabilities? So the idea is, uh, I honestly think that the powerful thing of Mathematica is just trying to join things from the real world and extract information in a natural language through uh, programming, but indeed, I'm from exactly the opposite way. I'm uh, happy to see that theory could be understood very well and could see visualized with Mathematica. So I think the most powerful uh, feature of Mathematica is it's so broad. It could be useful to understanding uh, applied uh, uh, concepts, and we can very easily extract uh, information from real world with this natural language, but could also be useful for more theoretical application in which we wanted to see uh, mathematical results. Yeah, very true. Um, I remember like a few projects I've done. I've used it both on like as an application side and also just to visualize the theory behind things. So I think that is, it's very versatile in that sense. Um, and then I guess, uh, is there any future work you want to do with Wolfram? Maybe like the continuation of this project or maybe an entirely different project? I'm afraid it will be considered entirely different project, but in the end, it's quite connected. We have seen that basically when we allow more technology to the uh, to the physics, we can start it to join mathematics, but therefore we can use mathematics to learn uh, more things about physics or other other disciplines. And ideally, that's what I'm trying to do. With uh, if we have electromagnetism, if we allow some numbers to be instead of real numbers that are the ones that we know from school, we allow them to be imaginary or complex numbers. We can see that. Even in the first time, this makes no sense uh, mathematically, uh, physically speaking. Mathematically speaking, they are quite useful. And when we get back to the physics, we discover that it's quite useful. And how this related to schemios? Because we can use schemios as a way of communicating information with us. And that's uh, done when we allow the things to be, instead of real numbers, complex numbers. So my next project, hopefully, is try to use uh, these, uh, these ideas of uh, mesoscopic ideas to try to control the light in the nanoscale, trying to co uh, build computers that are made with light instead of electrons. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool. Um, I'm interested in seeing it when you eventually publish it. Um, <laughs> Me also. <laughs> true. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us today and sharing your very interesting project. Um, have a good day. The pleasure was all mine. See you around. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wolfram Student Podcast. We hope you learned something new and took away insights from today's discussion. 
If you want to be featured in a future episode, fill out the form at tinyurl.com slash wsp-s2-interest. And be sure to tune back in one month's time to hear our next episode. Once again, thanks for listening to this episode of the Wolfram Student Podcast.